And we're gonna start today again with the ether. We have we haven't gotten rid of the etheris. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind. And we have this fellow. He's um, he was recommended to me. You know, they sent me his paper, and so I looked at it. Uh, I didn't get past the abstract. <laughs> Uh, it was over my head, you know, I, I'm not that smart, you know, so uh, uh, I didn't read it beyond that, it was beyond my pay grade completely. So here it is, uh, this guy from the East, somewhere, I don't know, Moldova or Transnistria or someplace like that, and uh, this is what he says, he says, and I imagine him as, uh, you know, that's not him, but that's how I imagine him because of the... He sounds a lot like the, uh, you know, Sacha Cohen, you know, and his imitation there of the Eastern folks. And this one says, on the general re reality of gravity, as well as other forces in nature and the creation of material particles, material particles, I wonder what other kinds there are, and force fields in the universe. And he goes out here ranting about different things. He says, it establishes the Planck constant represents what? The density of momentum of the void space in the universe. The density of momentum of the void space. Well, that is way over my head, for sure, okay? So uh, this guy's too smart for me. Anyways, he says, this work proves, you got to prove here, he's going to shove it down your throat, okay? That gravitational force has its opposite force in the internal momentum of atomic particles of matter. It establishes that two term uh, mass and electric charge introduced by mankind are not known in nature. Uh -huh. It is proven, again he proves, right? Uh, that in nature there is only one type of force and that is the force balance of inertial forces between the internal momentum of particles and a reversely oriented force of its own force field in the surroundings of mass particles. My God. And uh, yeah, again, this is over my head, so you know, who am I to even read this, right? I don't have the authority <laughs> to read this. This work further maintains that the essence of the composition of the mass of all atomic particles as well as all force fields in the universe is the same and is created by what the compression of density of the momentum of the void space <laughs> okay so yeah uh, this uh this fellow is obviously you know uh talking stuff that's way over my head over my pay grade i can't match it so i decided not to read <laughs> his paper um it was just too much for me you know i hope you understand and then I uh, had another fellow from uh, that side of the world, you know, Transnistria or who knows, Czechoslovakia or whatever, Yugoslavia. And he says the following, and again, you know, I can imagine these guys from the East, I don't know what they study, but this is what they say. And again, I'm imagining him as that, uh, as Sasha Cohen, you know, says it's very wrong to call a two-strand twine a rope. Uh-huh. Even the rope you show is two ropes. Any freaking rope on earth is made of many threads. When you point to that thing made of two ropes and say it's a rope, it's two pieces of rope, each made of many threads. It's never made out of two threads. That thing you call rope, I know for sure. It's martisor in my native language. You don't understand that word. Yeah, I, I guess I don't. I bet you can't even conceive that notion of martisor. Uh -huh. So what the guy is saying is, uh, Bill, Daddy, it is not the rock, it is the martisor. I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> so from now on, I beg from all of you, you know, don't call any more the rope hypothesis. It's now the Martisor hypothesis, okay? Here it is, okay? Just so you heard it here first, okay? It's the Martisor hypothesis. And uh, yeah, it consists of two atoms doing their quantum jump, 2D and 3D there, and torquing the rope in between, okay? So let's get it right, folks. It's the Martisor hypothesis or hypothesis, I guess. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm pronouncing that wrong. 
And I just hope everybody follows, you know, this recommendation. Otherwise, you're going to be upsetting or pissing off all the uh, Ukrainians and Polacks in Chicago. <laughs> okay, and uh, continuing with uh, some of these individuals here, we have an etherist. Remember this one? Uh, he ran away. Why? Because he couldn't tell us what the ether is. He couldn't illustrate the ether. He said he was a lousy painter. And then he couldn't tell us uh, how a particle turns the corner. And so the guy who turned the corner and left was him. Okay. But now uh, we have another uh, fellow. Uh, he comes around. He says the body. He says, uh, apparently he's not on ether. He's on crack. <laughs> he said the body. Ether is not a particle. Particles are ether perturbed. Aha. Uh -huh. Perturbed. Okay. It's hard to understand. Absolutely. Ether, rest, pure potential cannot be illustrated. I guess not. I guess, you know, how do you illustrate potential anyways? And only its perturbations can be. Okay, so, uh, so he's gonna, he can't illustrate the thing. He's going to illustrate what it does, which is perturbations. That's interesting. And then, as he says, since all things are ether perturbed, they are tied like a dog on a chain and stake to ether. So I guess some kind of string, I guess, uh, he would have to identify that, right? How it's uh, connected. All matter in ether is ether perturbed, which is the loss of potential, loss of potential that we call force and motion. And then it's returned back to ether pure potential. Man, I'd like to have whatever he had. <laughs> Objects are not accelerating towards each other. They are accelerating towards the null point between them. That no point being ether. Okay, so let's see if we can uh, collect all this and figure out what he's saying here. He's saying the ether is potential. It's the middle location between two objects, both of which are concepts. And concepts, as far as I know, have no power to perturb anything, especially objects, you know, things. So, yeah, unless he can uh, turn his ether into something, uh, I don't think he can have uh, any chance of influencing the physical world. Okay, so uh, this is something uh, that these people, you know, uh, <laughs> for some reason never catch. They're, they're, always, they're always thinking of concepts, and they want you to understand it through concepts. And no, you cannot. You need, in physics, the first rule of physics, you need to have objects. That's the golden principle. You can't do physics without objects. You need an object. And these people want to do it without objects. They take concepts and they turn them into objects. And then when you ask them to illustrate, you say, well, I can't illustrate because it's potential. Well, potential is not an object. Of course, you can't illustrate potential. And he said, but let me explain to you my theory. <laughs> Who cares about your theory? You've already started on the wrong foot. You need to have a physical object if you want to do physics. Physics is 150% materialistic. No spiritual people, no spiritualists allowed. Okay, so if you're spiritual, you talk about conscience and all this other nonsense, you're in the wrong field. That's how simple it is. Physics, you need physical objects. First rule, you need an object. Okay, so these people, you know, you wonder what they're doing in physics. They, they should be, you know, I mean, they should go to church and pray for their salvation or meditate or whatever, you know. And uh, so, you know, here you have these people and they're in the wrong field. They talk about, you know, the ether, and they talk about, you know, flying high, you know. And uh, so all I can recommend is that, you know, they come down to earth. And fortunately, there is a, um, a solution to this, okay? There is a solution, folks. Uh, it turns out that all these etherists, you know, they contribute nothing to my channel. Not, not in their comments, not in their questions, not in uh, anything. And they surely don't contribute any money. You know, no, none of these people go to Patreon and, you know, help the channel out. They're getting a free ride, okay? And so because of that, I was forced to go and get some sponsors for my channel, okay? So that they can, you know, help me out a little bit here. And uh, so right now, I know you don't like these things, but I'm going to have to do a commercial on behalf of my sponsor, okay? And it's just going to be brief, okay? Anyways, uh, if you're flying high, friends, you know, 
uh, because you're on ether or on crack or whatever, please remember to take graviton. Graviton will get you back down to earth. Okay, and they come in this handy little box, graviton there, you see it? Okay, and two pills a day, every eight hours should bring you back. Okay, so if you're high on ether, now you know there is a solution for you. Okay, <laughs> let's get back to, uh, to some rational science, even though we don't really have rational science when we have all these people come in here. Here you have one fellow, he says the following, he says, I do not understand why modern humans have such issue believing a God could exist. Uh-huh. So you can believe that we humans somehow came into existence out of nothingness, right? Uh, but God couldn't come to existence out of nothingness as well. So when humans see something like this, well, dark matter has to exist. And there's what he was uh, referring to. But uh, dark matter is just another term for God of the gaps, basically just with a cool name. God is real, people. He has put his signature all over, but the test is faith, not proof. And the problem he's got, you know, uh, a lot of these people I have out there, they don't realize that proof is faith, is 150% faith. In other words, whenever people talk about proof, they're referring to belief. They're talking about opinions, okay? And so what these people are doing, they're introducing evidence. And they say, look, let me convince you. Let me persuade you. Let me recruit you to my religion, to my congregation. And so they present evidence. They talk about proof, knowledge, and that kind of stuff. And all that, we wipe it all out completely. We don't use evidence in science. We don't use uh, proof, belief, opinion. All that's religion. What we do is we present a case, right? And if you want to present God, no problem. You can present God, you can present space time. The way it works is, you know, when you present God, you have to present an object, a thing. You're going to talk about God creating the universe or whatever, okay? Because you have to show us the mechanism of how God did it. You can't just say, well, I don't know that part of the theory. Well, that is your theory. That is your entire theory, how God created the universe, okay? So if you don't like uh, to theorize, all you have so far is a hypothesis, an assumption. You, you're not saying you believe in God, and the other guy, the atheist, comes around and he says, I don't believe in God, so I don't like your hypothesis. Well, we should get rid of both of them, and we should get rid of the agnostics as well, who say, well, I don't know if God exists or what tests we can run to prove the existence of God. All that is garbage. None of that has anything to do with science. The scientist is different in all three of those groups. Okay? And the way we do it in science is we say, let us assume God exists. God can only be an assumption. God can only be a hypothesis. A hypothesis is not an unproven theory. A hypothesis is uh, it, it consists of all the objects and the definitions and the initial scene. That's what a hypothesis is. A hypothesis is something you concede in order to understand the theory. You don't say, you don't say, I don't believe in your hypothesis. That's an irrational answer. Okay? But you, see, you can challenge the hypothesis and say, um, you know, I have a better one, a better mousetrap. You can also say that where it fails, that you can do. You can try to tear apart the hypothesis. It's got nothing to do with belief. It's got to do with, you know, logically demonstrating that the assumptions that the presenter made are, you know, irrational. But uh, other than that, you know, you can present God and say, let me show you God. And you point to God and say, this is God. Okay, and you see a human figure there with a beard and wand in his hand. No problem. No problem whatsoever. And that's a little more powerful than pointing to space time, which we're going to deal with today, and say, this is space time. So what are you pointing to? You're pointing to a bunch of number lines, and you're going to use that to explain gravity, the warping of space-time, this canvas, this trampoline. No, we have a problem with that. So in that sense, God is superior to space-time because God is a thing, if you present him as a thing. You, know, you can't present God as love or intelligence or grace or whatever. You can't present God as a concept. You have to present God as, a, as an object, as a thing. And if you say God exists, all you're saying is that thing that you just presented, that human-like figure, 
has location within the universe. Okay? There's a set of distances between God and every atom in the universe. There's a distance between his nose and my nose. No problem. That's what you mean by God exists. Do we believe that God exists? Do we don't believe that God exists? Irrelevant. It's an assumption. You say, let us assume that God exists. And now you can proceed to your theory. That's the way it works in science. Now, in the religion of atheism, theism, and agnosticism, they talk about belief and disbelief. And they say, well, I don't really not believe. I disbelieve. And they play around with it. They're chasing their tail around all the time. <laughs> no, no. In science, we reject all three of those groups and say, let us assume that God exists. And God is this well I'm pointing to. He's got uh, hands, arms, whatever. Then, then it's okay. Yeah, but you can't do that with space-time. Yeah, you cannot present space-time as a physical object to start your presentation. And that's going to be the problem with uh, general relativity in general. Okay, so last week I talked about uh, this. I mentioned this little note there. There are two people, A and B, in space with a taut rope. No tension currently in between them. And one fellow answers, that's wrong. The taut rope does have a tension. By definition, uh, yeah, absolutely. A taut rope has tension. Uh, taut and tension are synonyms. There is no difference between them. There is no motion when you talk about tension, when you talk about taut. Not in physics. In, in the religion of mathematics, they talk about how much it's stretched. So they're talking about values. And they're not really talking about taut or tension. They're talking about pull. Okay? When you pull on the elephant with your rope, whether the elephant pulls on you or not, it's pulling on you anyway, because there's an inertia there that you're struggling against. So you're stretching the, ro the rope, okay? And you can stretch it more and more and more and more. As long as you're stretching, you're, you're doing pull. You haven't, you haven't stopped, okay? It's only when you stop, completely stop, in other words, a static frame in the film, that you have tension, that you have tautness. Okay? Until then, you know. And so tension is a static concept, whereas pull is a verb. verb uh, pull, like push, uh, you know, there are forces, and force is a verb. It's a dynamic concept. And here's a, a little summary, you know, using the Universal movie. Okay? For those of you who never saw this before, well, what we show here is all the ones in yellow are static concepts. I, there's just an ex a couple examples. And at the bottom, you have in beige and uh, violet there, uh, you have the um, uh, dynamic concepts. Dynamic concepts take at least two frames. Uh, static concepts require a single one. And force and tension are totally different. Tension can be illustrated. The concept tension uh, can fit in a single frame. You don't need to move anything to have tension or tautness, okay? uh, tightness or whatever. Uh, Force, on the other hand, whether pull or push, you need two frames of the movie because someone is winning the tug of war. Tension, no one wins the tug of war. So uh, if this is the universal movie and uh, God takes a snapshot for us, right, and brings it to earth and shows it to us, well, in a single frame, all you have is every atom in the universe at a given location from every other an uh, atom in the universe. Okay, that's what you have. And uh, so it's a, all, whatever you see in that little frame is all static. So any uh, planets, any stars, any atoms, any electrons around the atom, everything is standing still. Everything is frozen. Okay? And that's uh, essentially, you know, what kills time dilation and all the other nonsense in, invented by um, the uh, mathematicians. Okay? So yeah, tension is a static concept. It's not a force in physics. Okay, tension uh, is a static concept. And so, yeah, a rope that is tense, that is truly, genuinely tense, is static. There's no motion. Okay? We don't care why, who's pulling, we don't care any of that. All we're saying is uh, tension in physics is like a dumbbell. It's a stick. Uh, that is made of a single piece uniting two objects. That's what tension is. Okay? So there is no motion. No one wins the tug of war in tension. And so, yeah, he's right. The, the taut rope is tense, no doubt about it. 
Okay, uh, here we have a fellow who, uh, how irrati an irrational fellow <laughs> explains things. Listen to this. Atoms can be a medium for electromagnetic waves. Okay, we don't know what electromagnetic waves are because wave is not a thing. It's a concept. Okay, there's no, wave is a verb. It's what something does. Okay, so you can't say the wave does this or whatever. So, um, you know, atoms can uh, be a, a medium for a wave, but wave cannot be a medium for anything. Okay, and so the guy continues, says, the electric flux, whatever it is. Oh, I like that. Electric flux, whatever that is, you know, I don't know, but yeah, the flux. So he just pulls these words out of nowhere and says, hey, I'm going to use them. But flux means flow. Okay, it means flow. What is flowing? And he says, ask Gauss, you know, uh, Gauss the math mathematician. And uh, between them is what bonds them together. Yeah, and so, so he never tells us what it is. That, he, that the object is, the thing is, the physical entity is. He talks about waves, which is not a concept, uh, which is a concept, which is not an object. He talks about a medium, but so far he hasn't mentioned any medium. He says flux, whatever that is, you know, it just means flow, okay? And then he says, uh, if you want to know what is, what is flowing, you know, the physical object that is flowing, ask Gauss. Okay, let's ask him. I went out there and uh, talked to Gauss, and he said the following. He says, uh, Gauss law states that the total electric flux out of a closed surface is equal to the charge enclosed divided by the permittivity. Okay? And the electric charge, charge, what is that? Uh, such as a single electron in space. Now, an electron is a physical object. Charge is a concept. So, no, charge is not an electron. An electron is not charge has an electric field surrounding it. Field is not a physical object. Field cannot surround anything, okay? Because the only thing that can surround something is a physical object, some kind of container or, uh, you know, uh, anything that, like, like a coat surrounds your body. You know, that, that would be a, a thing. But field, field is a bunch of numbers. And so you can't say the electric field surrounds something, uh, the region. In pictorial form, this electric field is shown as lines of flux being radiated from a dot, the charge. Okay, so again, he brings these concepts. These are called the Gauss lines. We don't have any lines in physics. Line is, uh, is a two-dimensional rectangle, elongated rectangle. That's all the line is as far as physics is concerned. That's all that is in front of your eyes. You know, a line is just an extended rectangle. Uh, two, and it's two-dimensional. It's a... It's a Plane, in other words, right? Note that <clears throat> field lines are a graphic illustration of field strength and direction and have no physical meaning. Oh, I like that. Uh, there's no physical meaning to all this. <laughs> yeah, uh, when you talk about field and lines, right, there's nothing to illustrate really because uh, you're not talking about physical entities, therefore it has no physical meaning. I think this came out of uh, the stack exchange. I'm not sure now. The density of these lines corresponds to the electric field strength, also called the electric flux density, the number of lines per unit area. In other words, when we ask Gauss, he has no idea, you know, what the mediator is. So when this fellow asks us to go in and talk to Gauss, like, you know, uh, he, he knows what all this stuff is, though we find out that Gauss doesn't know either. So what are we left with? We're left with not understanding how this fellow conceptualizes electricity. You know, he's talking about current electricity. He's talking about the flow of fluxes and the fluxes flowing. And, you know, has no idea whatsoever because he's never identified the object, the physical object. And here you have a, a, a good a summary of that or a pictorial representation of what all these people are talking about. And this, I think, explains it quite well for anyone who wants to understand it, right? Here we have the electricity according to the religion of quantum mechanics. And they have it as flowing electron beads. They call them charges, like this fellow said, right? This is what they learn in high school, and they just parrot and never question it. And what they have is that all these beads go from atom to atom, right? And this is a simplistic version. In other words, we put a hydrogen atom there, a, bunch, a row of hydrogen atoms, and we have the beads moving from atom to atom, 
That's the explanation for electricity, the flux flow, float flux, right? That this fellow is talking about. And this is what they've always been taught, that you have all these beads just going from atom to atom. No one explains what got the first bead to move if all these beads are discrete entities, right? So what, the, what got them to move, we don't know. All they say, all these charges are flowing. No, charges can't flow because your charge is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. That's what charge is. So you can't say a, a number flowed or fluxed. So this is the notion they have. We have a different notion of what electricity is. We have all these atoms. Again, we're illustrating it with hydrogen atoms, okay? And uh, for simplicity's sake, just to understand the concept. And it's that all these um, atoms, right, really molecules, they're merged with the one next to it. All the neighbors are merged and they all uh, spin or, you know, uh, rotate in place. They, they spin around in situ, right? And so electricity is not flowing anything from A to B, from negative to positive or anything like that. What it is is torsion in situ, in situ torsion. Okay? It's turning in place, okay? So we have different concepts of what electricity is the nonsense that has been taught in um, in high school and college and is continued to be taught in high school and college even to this day, right? But uh, uh, what is the what is the quantum version based on? Well, it's based on this on the irrational planetary atom. This is their atom, and so yeah, if you have an electron bead that's just going around and moving from energy level to energy level, uh, and then it um, you know, flies away sometimes, okay? And if it flies away, the question is, why did it uh, not fall to the positive nucleus if the electron is negative? And what forces it to uh, fly away later on? You know, so this, this is the problem with this model. Now, what, uh, you'll hear that uh, they don't believe in the planetary model anymore. And that's a total lie. You know, they, they said we have a new uh, atom in quantum mechanics. And that's not really true. See, what, what they did was they say, well, it's not that, you know, it's, it doesn't go in an orbit. That's all they said. They, they eliminated the orbit, the smooth orbit. They say the electron just bumps back and forth and can be found anywhere within a certain region around the nucleus. And it just, you know, it's here, there, and, and, and there. It just jumps around. That's all they said. That's the atom today. But they still consider the electron to be a negative bead that's somewhere around the nucleus, which is a positive nucleus. Most of it, at least in the case of hydrogen, there's only a proton, right? And so what they have is this electron bead, which is no longer orbiting in circles or in ellipses or whatever. Now it jumps around, you know? And so they say, well, we don't know where the electron is. Who cares? You still have a planetary type atom where you have a little bead surrounding a bowling ball. That's the atom that they have. And yeah, um, what happens with that is when they do electricity, like this guy got, you know, this is how he got indoctrinated in, in high school or college or whatever. Um, <clears throat> when, when they do electricity, sometimes they get rid of the atom altogether. They just do, do it with the electron beads. No atoms. See, here you have it. Uh, these are the three versions, okay? You have the original version, which is the classical version, more or less you could say, which is the electron beads flowing from atom to atom. Then they get rid of the atom itself, the nucleus at least, right? And you have only the beads flowing, right? And again, you see our model at the bottom. There's no flow of anything. All we have is torsion, in situ torsion. Okay, that's why gravity, uh, why electricity is so fast, because it goes nowhere. As soon as you turn on something, you have clockwise on one side and counterclockwise on the other side, right? Depending on from what direction you're looking at. And so this positive and negative is only an issue of clockwise and counterclockwise. Mother Nature does not understand positive or negative invented by humans. Mother Nature does understand clockwise and counterclockwise. Okay, so um, uh, some people, like the electric universe, these individuals, they, they're even worse. I mean, <laughs> what they do is the following. They, they say that uh, all stars are connected by electricity. And they show this, you know, these filaments, okay, that connect stars and galaxies and planets and who knows what else. They think gravity is electricity, or that electricity is gravity. 
And so the question here is, you know, if, if gravity is electricity, electricity is gravity, and what you have is, um, according to the model, right, beads flowing from one atom to another, what they're essentially saying is that the entire universe is full of atoms. Everything is full of atoms. And what you have, the electron beam going from atom to atom, from one star to another. In other words, between any two stars, there's gazillions of atoms. The entire universe is filled with atoms. And the only reason that, you know, the electron beam can flow from the first atom to the last atom that's close to the other star is because you have this, this uh, string of atoms that carry the electron beam from here to there. But if we get rid of the atom, that's even worse because now you have these beads, these electron beads just flowing through space from star to star, from galaxy to galaxy. And it means that, you know, the reason we're attracting Andromeda galaxy is we do it electrically, not gravitationally. That means that we're doing electricity. That's according to the electric universe. And that means that they have all this series of atoms and the electron bead is going from atom to atom, from one galaxy to the other. And, okay, even if we concede that, <laughs> let's concede it. What the hell? I mean, no problem. We concede it. We're, we got all these atoms. They're all discrete entities. The, each atom is a discrete entity. Each electron flowing from atom to atom is a discrete entity. How do you maintain this pull, this, this uh, you know, how does one... Uh, uh, star attract another? How does one galaxy attract another if it's made of all these discrete entities that cannot pull? You know, I can't pull with a bunch of balls in a, in a row. I can pull on the first ball, that, that doesn't pull on the next ball unless there's some kind of connection that you can illustrate and identify for us, right? But if you have a series of balls, it's like, you know, uh, from one star to another, okay, pull on the first ball. See if the last ball comes towards you. How do you do it? And that's the problem with the electric universe, all this nonsense about positive and negative. They deal with positive and negative because they, they're going to be talking about concepts. They're going to say positive attracts negative. They don't know how it does. They don't know what the mechanism is. They just say it does. And with that, they want to explain gravity. No, you have to put a physical object. We need to see, you know, a physical object that you illustrated, a mediator, you know, that you can show us how you pulled that star, you know, in the, in the case of uh, the Andromeda galaxy, is moving towards the Milky Way galaxy. And I think the electric universe accepts that. The question is, how does our, our galaxy or their galaxy pull on, on us? You know, how do, how do you pull with discrete balls if you're going to do it with electricity? And again, uh, the only way we can do that is if every atom in Andromeda is connected, physically connected to every atom in our galaxy, Meaning that there's some kind of invisible, intangible, elongated mediator that connects every atom here to every atom there. Only then can we explain attraction, pull, okay? Okay, so here we have, uh, uh, I think, the same fellow. And he says, electromagnetic waves can be, electromagnetic waves can be longitudinal. Because I said the other day that they were transverse. That's the official line. And... And we don't talk about waves, but yeah, whatever it is, it's transverse, right? But this fellow says it's longitudinal and can penetrate solid metal. Uh-huh. And he says, Professor Mayo of Germany has experimental kits for sale to the public that demonstrate longitudinal electromagnetic waves. Well, uh, who has it said... Uh, P.T. Barnum said, there's a sucker born every day, so I suggest you go and buy the kit, you know? I mean, who knows? Uh, so here's Professor uh, Mail. I went to talk to him, you know, see what he has to say. And uh, he could not tell me what that wave is made out of, right? The transverse wave is made out of vectors, according to the official version, okay? So uh, not much we can do there, you know? Uh, we don't have, the wave is not a physical object. It's just made out of vectors. What is a vector? Magnitude and direction, okay? But here you have um, the longitudinal wave, you know, goes back and forth. Unlike the transverse wave always goes forward, longitudinal wave always goes back and forth. And so the question is, what brings it back? And is that what happens with light? 
And so the people I have a problem with his longitudinal wave because he's got to explain, you know, what it's made out of and show us, uh, you know, uh, what how the uh, wave pulls backwards, in other words, how it moves backwards as well as forward. You know, with uh, sound, you have this compression and rarefaction of the molecules of the air, and that's why you can hear. You have all these vibrations. And that's more or less what he's saying light is. Well, all he's got to do is explain, you know, what light is made out of, right? The mediator of light, and shows what the mechanism is. And of course, uh, I'm sure uh, Professor Whale is only too busy selling his gadgets to, you know, the suckers that are born every day and uh, who, <laughs> who believe that, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, that um, light is also a longitudinal wave, okay? That came out of the uh, fact that, you know, when you do the slit experiment, the way they illustrate it is with these water waves. Well, water waves are longitudinal and transverse wave. They have both components in them uh, because the water, like I showed the other day, you know, also goes backward and forward, backward and forward. That's why it's, that's the longitudinal component. And you can't do that with light because light goes forward, never goes backwards except under the rope model where you really don't have back and forth. All you have is torsion in situ, but that causes pressure on both atoms, on the electron shells of both atoms. Okay, so ours is back and forth in that sense only, okay, that it's bi-directional, but there is no pull or push. Again, you know, so, okay, um, I said here, um, the other day that uh, if you take a, a laser from the Earth and you point it at the uh, moon, at the uh, retro reflector there, and uh, they did this experiment, by the way, uh, I think it was Apollo 15 uh, left the um, retro reflector on the moon, the uh, uh, astronauts did. And so they point, today, uh, or uh, I think the experiment is now over, but they did for a few years where they pointed a laser at the retro reflector and got a signal back. The official version was that the um, lasers threw billions of photons to the retro reflector and only got three or four back. Okay, so uh, uh, because, you know, you have the, the Earth's atmosphere and you have also the distance and everything moves, etc., etc. And so they only got three or four photons back, but enough to be able to collect them on their detectors. And they said, okay, we've proven, you know, that we can send uh, laser light to the retro reflector and back. And it's used to, uh, to gauge the distance of uh, the moon with respect to the Earth. Well, here we show that you don't have to send anything out there. There is no sending. The rope simply twirls in situ. Every atom on Earth, which I have not drawn every single one, by the way, uh, every atom on Earth is connected to every atom on the moon, including the ones that make up the retro reflector on the moon. Okay? That means that uh, the moon can go anywhere it wants. The rope that connects one atom at the retro reflector is connected to one atom of the laser, Right? We're just going to look at two atoms here, one atom there, one atom here. They're connected by a rope. That rope twirls at a given frequency. In other words, there's so many links and um, so, so, so much uh, the, the link length is so large, etc. Right? And so we receive that image back from the moon simply because that atom is connected to the laser on, the, on Earth. Period. We're done. So the Earth, the moon can go anywhere at once. Okay, that was the explanation under the rope model. So this fellow goes in there and he um, he says the following. He says, Math, Mythbusters debunked that years ago. Exactly what they debunked. I have no idea what this fellow is referring to. I don't know if uh, he's saying that they debunked that, uh, that the laser does not come back or what it is. He, he didn't explain what, what they debunked. Uh, so they visited an observatory that has a laser, which they used to demonstrate how much laser light is sent to the moon and how much comes back. Okay, yeah. The latter figure being relatively minuscule, okay. There is no way the light from a laser is in a medium that is connected to only the moon. No, nobody said it's connected to only the moon. Again, these people don't, don't listen. Uh, no, it's connected to every atom in the universe. Okay. 
The ropes are connected to every atom in the universe, from one atom to every single atom in the universe, radially, you know, in every direction. Okay? So let's get that right. It's not just connected to one atom on the moon. Okay? And then most of the laser light is wasted on Earth's atmosphere, yeah? And the light that does make it to the moon either reflects off in the wrong direction or comes back to Earth, not necessarily to the telescope pointing at the relevant location on the moon. So I don't know what he's saying about debunking. I don't know if he understood what uh, Mythbusters debunked. So I went there and got the video, okay? And what the Mythbusters were trying to debunk was the notion that uh, people have that man did not go to the moon. That's the notion they were. They're saying, look, we put a retro reflector there. If we can point our laser to that retro reflector and get some photons back, it means there is a retro reflector and someone put it there and it had to be an astronaut. That's what they were saying. So here, let me point that, uh, put that uh, piece of the video from Mythbusters. I dubbed it, uh, you know, for different reasons. And here it is. Listen carefully. If there was a retro reflector on the moon, and we knew its exact location, and we had a powerful enough laser, we could detect the reflection and prove that there is man-made equipment on the moon. Okay, so what they were showing is that man had to go to the moon to put the retro reflector there, and therefore it proves, according to the Mythbusters, that man did indeed go to the moon. That's the notion they were, uh, they were trying to uh, debunk the notion that people have that man did not go to the moon. That was the whole purpose of that whole video, okay? And uh, did they do that? Were they able to really debunk it? And no, now we're going to debunk the Mythbusters. Okay, let's debunk them. And we don't debunk anybody first in science because we don't believe in debunking. There is no such thing as debunking in science. Debunking just means that I proved you wrong according to me. <laughs> but according to you, I did not prove you wrong, so who's right? You know, these are opinions. Proof is opinion. Please, proof is belief. Proof does not belong in science. But let's debunk them. <laughs> Let's debunk the debunkers, okay? Here it is, okay? And this was Lunik 17, sent by the Soviets, okay? Was an uncrewed, not unscrewed, but uncrewed lunar vehicle equipped with what? A laser retro reflector supplied by France. In April 2010, the Apache Point Observatory Lunar Laser Ranging Operation team announced that they had found a long lost Lun uh, Lunathod one rover and had received returns from the laser retro reflector. So now after so many years, they found it again, okay? It's on the moon. It was sent by an uncrewed lunar vehicle. There was no crew and they were able to put a retro reflector on the moon without putting a human on the moon, okay? So we don't need humans to put things on the moon. And a lot of people don't seem to understand that. They sent all kinds of stuff. They sent a rover to Mars, roaming around Mars, for those of you who believe that, right? Because there's a lot of people who don't believe that. Um, and, uh, and, and so you don't need to have humans put things, you know, uh, on the moon. You can do it with robots. And that's essentially what's happened here. And here is the uh, Russian, the Soviet, I guess, um, uh, documentation of that. Okay, here it is. Listen carefully or watch carefully. Here it is. A happy landing for Russia's unmanned Luna 17 spacecraft and a big step forward for Soviet scientists in Lenin's Jubilee year. The first self-propelled vehicle ever to drive across the lunar landscape is controlled from Earth. It's been sending back television pictures and carries, among other equipment, a laser reflector. So now Soviet space experts have proved their theory that space exploration can be carried out by automatic equipment without risking the lives of astronauts. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we don't need... So the debunkers, these uh, Mythbusters, they didn't debunk the notion that man did not go to the moon. 
it's irrelevant what they said about that. Uh, the fact that there is a retro reflector on the moon does not mean that the deb that uh, MythBusters are correct in having debunked anything. Uh, so for a lot of people, the, this uh, notion that men went to the moon or did not go to the moon, you know, it's still a de under debate. Now, I say, you know, all I can tell you is my uh, assumptions. I make the assumption that man did go to the moon. Okay, I, I, I have explained about that, you know, uh, uh, related to that in the past, saying that if we can send a uh, probe, a rocket, whatever, all the way to the moon, an unmanned one, there's no reason not to be able to send a human out to the moon. Okay, and so this notion that people have that we did not have the technology in the uh, uh, 1960s to send rockets to the moon. I think that's where people have to do their research. And yes, we, we have sent uh, objects to the moon. And I also talked about the ISS, International Space Station, and it goes around the Earth, you know, uh, what was it, 15 times per day. And all you have, and uh, NASA, you know, publishes the route. So if you can move to a re if you really are interested, go to the region, you'll see the this thing go over your head. And this thing is enormous, right? It's really enormous. And they built it little by little. So uh, the question is, do we have things out there that, you know, go around the earth and so on, satellites and so on? You better believe that. <laughs> That's what we have out there. You know, we, don't, we do not talk through, you know, sardine cans when we talk on the phone. That's one issue. The other one is that it took many trips to the ISS to build it. And so if we have the technology to do this thing. We have the technology to go to the moon. And again, going to the moon is no special thing. It's just a question of, you know, just follow Newton's uh, laws and you'll find out that it's not so difficult to send something to the moon. You need a rocket and that's it. Okay, so. Uh, I always make the assumption that man did go to the moon until I find something that convinces me otherwise, you know. Certainly not shadows, uh, stars in the background, the jumping gravity, that kind of stuff. You're not going to convince me on that side because, again, the, the ar main argument is that unless you can show, unless you can show that um, the actual going to the moon uh, is uh, could not have been done in Hollywood, and vice versa. That you could do it with in Hollywood, uh, then you have no case. Because if we can do it in Hollywood, uh, show me that uh, what they did in reality, which is send someone to the moon, was not made in Hollywood, or that it was not made in Hollywood. You know, you got to show, you got to eliminate one of those two possibilities. And no one can do that because as soon as you say, well, this was made in Hollywood, yeah, uh, you could say, of course it could have been done in Hollywood. No doubt about it. You haven't shown, you haven't debunked the notion that they went to the moon just by saying it could have been done in Hollywood. Yeah, it could have been done for real. It could have been done in Hollywood. And, you know, so, and uh, all those errors, I'm sure that if they did it in Hollywood, they would have made so many errors also.